Lecture 10, Part 2 on Soil Water Unsaturated Zone Hydrology. This figure shows the infiltration rate F during a storm with constant rainfall intensity IR. At the beginning, when all rainwater infiltrates, the infiltration rate F simply equals the rainfall intensity IR. The infiltration rate then is smaller than the maximum rate at which rain falling on the soil surface could have infiltrated. This maximum rate is presented by the broken curve. After some time, however, due to the packing of the soil surface by rain, swelling of the soil, breakdown of soil aggregates and or inwashing of fine materials to soil surface openings, the soil surface porosity decreases, which may cause the upper few millimeters of the soil to become water saturated and then for water to start ponding, forming small pools and puddles at the soil surface. After ponding occurs at TP, which stands for time to ponding, the infiltration rate will decline as shown by the decreasing curve in full. The infiltration rate then equals the maximum rate at which rain falling on the soil surface can infiltrate. At sloping land surfaces, the difference between the rainfall intensity in millimeter per hour and the declining infiltration rate after ponding in millimeter per hour runs over the land surface as infiltration excess overland flow, also in millimeter per hour, which is also called Hortonian overland flow after American ecologist and soil scientist Robert E. Horton. In hydrological literature, the maximum rate at which rain falling on the soil surface can infiltrate is referred to as the infiltration capacity. The decreasing broken curve thus shows the decline of the infiltration capacity before ponding starts, when the infiltration rate is equal to the rainfall intensity, and the curve in full shows the observed decline of the infiltration capacity after ponding. The time to ponding is shorter when the rainfall intensity is higher. This figure shows the infiltration rate F and the time to ponding TP for storms with different constant rainfall intensities. Ponding will not occur when the rainfall intensity IR remains below the value of the saturated hydraulic conductivity K of the upper soil. The additional curve shown here, connecting times to ponding for storms with different rainfall intensities, is called an infiltration envelope. The infiltration envelope is an important curve and the time to ponding an important parameter in erosion studies. On a hill slope, ponding leads to overland flow, which in turn causes a further detachment and transport of soil particles downslope erosion by overland flow. Some of these soil particles had already been detached earlier by the impact of falling raindrops on the soil surface, a process called splash erosion. After rain ends, restoration of the infiltration capacity begins. Soil pores open by wind action, differential temperatures near the soil surface, shrinkage of the soil, and or by earthworms and insects or voles and moles bringing back perforations in the soil. An exception to this can be when crusts have formed at the land surface. Crusts are thin soil surface layers that reduce infiltration. They are more compact and hard when dry than the material directly beneath it. They develop in certain soils when a soil surface dries out after rainfall or irrigation. The gradual decline of the ponded infiltration rate with time has also been described by Horton as an exponential decrease that reaches a minimum constant infiltration rate Fc that is equivalent to the saturated hydraulic conductivity. In the empirically derived Horton equation for ponded infiltration shown here, Ft 
is the infiltration rate at time t in length per time, for instance, millimeter per hour, then fc is the final infiltration rate in millimeter per hour, f0 is the infiltration rate at time t is zero in millimeter per hour, e is the base of natural logarithms, thus 2.71, etc. Alpha is a decay constant per hour, and t is time in hour. What the Horton equation for ponded infiltration boils down to is a characteristic of a negative exponential curve e to the power minus alpha t, which is that after every step delta t, t1 minus 0 or t2 minus t1, etc., a new value for ft minus fc is obtained by multiplying the earlier value with a constant factor e to the power minus alpha delta t, that is smaller than 1. For a time step 2 delta 2, you can use this constant factor squared. For a time step half a delta t, the square root of this constant factor, etc. The derivations are given here, so you may want to hold this video to take a better look, or even better, study the pages 176 to and including 178 of my book. The value of alpha in the Horton equation determines the curvature of the decline of the ponded infiltration rate with time. Alpha has as unit per time, for instance, per hour. The larger alpha, the steeper the decline. You may find it easier to reason from the reciprocal of alpha, which is a time constant, that has as a unit, for instance, hour. If we name this constant c, then e to the power minus alpha t in the Horton equation for ponded infiltration becomes e to the power minus t divided by c, and e to the power minus alpha delta t becomes e to the power minus delta t divided by c. Then, the larger the time constant c, the longer the time it takes, the slower the decline. Australian soil physicist John R. Phillip developed a physical approximation, a first analytical solution to the Richards equation of ponded infiltration. His method is especially suited for the first stages of infiltration into a relatively dry soil profile where gravity plays only a minor role. The infiltration rate f is in length per unit of time, for instance, millimeter per minute. Then s is the sorptivity in millimeter per the square root of minute and k is the saturated hydraulic conductivity in millimeter per minute, the asymptotic end value of the infiltration rate f. The curve that you see is the result of fitting a curve through data from an infiltration experiment. The figure shows an example of the ponded infiltration rate f in millimeter per minute versus the time in minutes. Infiltration is governed by two forces, capillary action and gravity. Pores pull in water by capillary action, and this action, as you know, is more prominent for smaller pores and drier soil. Small pores may even pull in water against the force of gravity, as is evident in the capillary fringe discussed at the beginning of this lecture. Thus, if during an infiltration experiment or at the beginning of a rain event we still have a relatively dry soil and ponded water at the surface, capillary action is very important. The sorptivity S in the Philip equation is a measure of the capacity of a porous medium to absorb or desorb liquid by capillary action. Note that the unit of sorptivity is length per square root of time for instance, millimeter per the square root of minute. At the beginning of infiltration, when t in the equation is still small, the first term in the right-hand part of the equation, half st to the power of minus a half, 
is important. As time passes, the wetting front moves down and T in the equation increases, causing this term half ST to the power minus a half, which is half S divided by the square root of T, to become less important. Because of this, the sorptivity S can only be reliably determined from the early stages of infiltration. For very large times of ponded infiltration, half ST to the power minus a half becomes zero, and the infiltration rate F will again, same as for the earlier discussed infiltration equations, be equal to the saturated hydraulic conductivity K. When we mathematically integrate this equation over time, we obtain the cumulative infiltration uppercase F in millimeter, which is the total volume of water in cubic millimeter added to the soil by infiltration per square unit of land surface in square millimeter as a function of time. This equation and the figure to the right show an example of the cumulative infiltration uppercase F in millimeter versus time in minutes. The curve is the result of fitting a curve through data from the same infiltration experiment as shown to the left. The saturated hydraulic conductivity K can now be found as the slope of the straight part of the curve to the right, where, because T is large, ST to the power and a half becomes much less important than KT, and K can be determined as the slope of the function F equals KT. Both equations can be used to estimate values for the sorptivity S and saturated hydraulic conductivity K. First determine K, either as asymptotic end value from the left figure, or from the right figure, as the slope of a straight part of the cumulative infiltration curve during the later stages of infiltration. After having estimated a value for K, simply look up the ponded infiltration rate, lowercase f, or the cumulative infiltration, uppercase f, at T is one minute. From these figures, inserting T is one minute in the equation gives these equations. As we already know, lowercase or uppercase f at t is one minute, we can calculate a value for the sorptivity s from either one of these equations. This sheet is specifically for the GO4-4417 unsaturated zone hydrology students. In reality, the saturated hydraulic conductivity will be larger than the calculated value from an infiltration experiment using either a double ring infiltrometer or a rainfall simulator. This is because of the hampering effect that enclosed air during the infiltration experiment has on the final infiltration rate. Because of this, as a rather crude rule of thumb, the saturated hydraulic conductivity is often taken as one and a half times the calculated value from an infiltration experiment. When we name the calculated value from an experiment A and the real larger saturated hydraulic conductivity Ks, plus I now is used as symbol for the infiltration rate, then this sheet shows a worked out example of the early stages, the first three measurement points of an infiltration experiment using the Philip equation shown here. What the method boils down to is that you linearize the Philip equation by plotting values of the infiltration rate along the vertical axis against one divided by the square root of time along the horizontal axis. By the way, the time sequence of the measurement points then is from right to left, the right data point being the first measurement and the left data point being the third measurement. Importantly, by plotting your time versus infiltration rate data this way, half the sorptivity S can be found as the slope of the line connecting these measurement points in this graph. And A is the intercept of that line with the vertical axis in this graph. GO4 
4417 students, you may want to hold this video and study this at ease. For all students, GO24203 and GO44417, yet another way to estimate the selectivity S is from a horizontal infiltration experiment on a long soil core sample in the laboratory as shown in this figure. Because the horizontal water flow in such an experiment is mainly controlled by capillary action, the Philip equation for cumulative infiltration reduces to F equals the sorctivity times the square root of T, the first term of the Philip equation. At time T, at the end of the experiment, the distance from the water inlet to the wetting front L is measured and the cumulative infiltration determined from F equals L times the pore space that was available for horizontal infiltration, which is the volumetric moisture content at saturation, theta S, minus the initial volumetric moisture content, theta I. As T, the time the experiment ended, and F are known, S can simply be estimated from F equals S times the square root of T. In practice, sorptivity values are determined by both the wetness of the soil and the soil texture. Sorptivity values measured in the field may therefore show a large variation in time and over short distances. When the infiltration capacity exceeds the rainfall intensity, as for instance in well vegetated areas, the infiltration rate equals the rainfall intensity and there will be no ponding of water at the soil surface. This figure shows an example of a potential diagram for non-ponding infiltration. Thus, without water saturation in the upper soil profile and with water pressures, the matrix potentials in the profile remaining negative. The follow-up process of infiltration is percolation and in order for water to percolate to the groundwater, the moisture content in the upper soil must be above field capacity. Remember, field capacity is moisture content where there is still some air in the pore space. This is clearly different from ponded infiltration, which causes water saturation and positive water pressures near the soil surface, as observed earlier. When rainfall ceases, the zone wetted by infiltration continues to move downward, whilst the upper soil already starts to dry by evaporation. This figure shows an example of a potential diagram where soil moisture moves downward by percolation below minus 20 cm and upward by evaporation above minus 20 cm depth. In our example, moisture thus moves both down and upward from minus 20 cm, causing a no flow situation at exactly minus 20 cm. If we take this figure as representative for a surrounding flat soil, the no flow situation holds for a horizontal plane at minus 20 cm depth. Such a horizontal plane with no flow or zero flux is called a zero flux plane, more specifically a divergent zero flux plane as moisture moves away from it. In temperate climates, a divergent zero flux plane typically starts to develop in spring when evaporation starts to exceed rainfall. This figure with soil depth along the vertical axis and the months of the year along the horizontal axis shows the divergent zero flux plane to move downward as the soil dries out further in spring and summer. In autumn, when rainfall starts to exceed evaporation, the surface layers become wetter and a convergent zero flux plane develops. This convergent zero flux plane moves down rapidly to meet up with the earlier divergent zero flux plane. When they meet, both zero flux planes disappear as the overall moisture flow in the wetted soil profile has become downward, which is the typical drainage situation for winter. This situation lasts till spring when evaporation starts to exceed rainfall again. Soils consist of a sequence of layers or soil horizons, in Dutch bodemhorizonte, which are layers caused by natural soil forming processes. Soil layering has a pronounced effect on the movement of water through the soil profile. 
especially when soil horizons differ markedly in hydraulic conductivity and dominant pore sizes. Percolation from a fine textured layer overlying a coarse textured layer leads to stagnation in the percolation process, as is evident from this figure, where the volumetric moisture content and matrix potential are given along the horizontal axis and the soil depth along the vertical axis. The numbers given in the graphs are time in hours. This apparently surprising effect is caused by the fact that the smaller pores in the fine textured upper layer hold on to the soil moisture with greater suction power. Only after continued wetting from above has reduced this suction power minus psi to a value that matches with the capillary pore diameter of the below coarse textured layer can water enter this lower layer. This reduced suction by wetting is visible in this figure as a less negative matrix potential psi when water enters this lower layer. Further note that there is a discontinuity in moisture content between both layers, see the left figure, but that the matrix potential or pressure head, see the right figure, is continuous, as it physically should be. Percolation through a fine textured layer that overlies a coarse textured layer may give rise to the development of wet finger-shaped areas in the coarse textured layer. For instance, because the capillary pore diameter of the below coarse textured layer in reality is not constant, but differs from place to place, or simply because the layers are not fully homogeneous. This type of flow is called fingered flow and is a type of preferential flow. Fingered flow may be defined as unstable flow that results from a higher resistance to water flow at certain locations in a soil. During infiltration and or percolation, the wetting front may stagnate at certain locations, for instance, at the transition from a fine textured layer to a coarse textured layer, as illustrated here. Continued wetting at these locations causes the matrix suction to decrease, the matrix potential to become less negative, or in simpler terms, causes the water pressure at these locations to increase. When a threshold water pressure value is exceeded, the water flow at that location is resumed. However, at locations where the threshold water pressure is not exceeded, water flow continues to stagnate. Because of this, wet finger-shaped areas begin to form at locations where the water flow is resumed. This photo shows a soil pit profile in the Parapuñas experimental catchment in Extremadura, Spain, where a coloring dye has been added to the infiltrating water. Infiltration in the top of the profile is shown to be homogeneous, but at some 10 cm depth, a large finger has developed. In our soil water lectures, we have mainly regarded matrix flow water flow through the soil matrix where the Richards equation applies. It is quite well established that nutrients, trace metals, manurial pathogens, pesticides or other chemicals used in agriculture generally reach the water table much more rapidly and in higher concentrations than one would predict using the Richards equation or one of its analytical approximations as just introduced. This is because a large part of the water generally flows through vertical preferential pathways. Such as cracks, shown to the right here, root holes or wormholes, effectively bypassing the soil matrix as it infiltrates and percolates to recharge the groundwater. In general, the flow of soil water and its solutes, substances dissolved in water, via preferential paths is called preferential flow. At least three major types of preferential flow may be distinguished, macropore flow, fingered flow, and funnel flow. Section 4.9 in my book introduces these types of preferential flow and provides a narrative on the subject. Preferential flow is more the rule than the exception. And for instance, the calculations of exercise 4.9 show that taking the soil as homogeneous can lead to a strong underestimation of the maximum depth of infiltration in a soil under high rainfall intensities.
It is my hope that these lectures on soil water, together with chapter four of my book, have clearly outlined the basics of soil water storage and flow as a logical follow-up on chapter three on groundwater, and that it has provided useful information and a head start to those wanting to get deeper entangled in physical hydrology and soil water flow. Good luck with the exercises.